Ok, eh, I would present in Spanish. Buenos días a todos. Hoy en charlas de economía estamos con Amir Neto. Amir es profesor asistente eh, de economía de la Universidad de Florida Gulf Coast en el departamento del Luger, en el Luger College de, de Business y él es el director interino del eh, de Centro de Investigación Regional del Luger College también. Eh, Amir eh, es un profesor que trabaja temas de investigación regional urbana, mercado laboral y tiene muy buenas publicaciones en de, que van desde los últimos años. Eh, Amir, thank you very much for being here and uh, please go ahead. Thank you for the good. Oh, I wait, I have to make you, I have to make you focus. Yes. You forget. Thank you for the kind words, Juan. <laughs> uh, I forgot about that, sorry. Thanks. Yeah, you right. can share your screen now. Please go ahead. All right, so I'll share the whole screen and yeah, I won't be seeing you probably. So for... yeah, you get you get a little thing on oh. the side. Oh yeah, three stars. So yeah. let me yeah, let me stop sharing these and share the whole screen. I think it's gonna yeah, be you can, if you share the whole if you share the whole screen, yes, and you go yeah. uh, full mode control command L. There we go. Oh, there we go. What's going on? Um, you want to try to open it with uh, with uh, with the other, yeah, with the other application. With the, uh, I can do that. Yeah. I'm gonna try using uh, preview. Oh, preview. Okay. Yeah, preview. Yeah, there we go. Shift Command F. All right. So thank you, Juan, for inviting me. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Uh, so this paper is the facts of Dollar General openings on the Napster firms. I will not practice my Spanish, so, <laughs> uh, but I'll probably be able to understand some questions if need be. Uh, this project is uh, in collaboration with Emilia Bill, who is my colleague here in the Department of Economics and Finance at Florida Gulf Coast University. So let me bring a little bit of the motivation behind the project. And again, if you guys have any questions in any point in time, uh, we're economists, so feel free to interrupt at uh, any point. So Dollar General is growing and it's growing a lot. So if you look at the some of the headlines talking about Dollar General. We were talking about 100,000 uh, new stores in next year and next year here was 2020. Uh, Dollar General was becoming the number one retailer in openings. Uh, and one thing that is interesting about Dollar General is that not only it expanded to almost every state in the country, but it has a different uh, business model to Walmart and other big box that um, or retailers that will provide uh, some sort of food, uh, groceries, uh, and other types of goods there. And the business model really focuses on going to places where these big boxes are not. So expanding to rural America and uh, downtown uh, that it has not been gentrified yet. So Dollar General, uh, if you, I don't know if all of you have been to the US, but it's going to be, Dollar General is very unique. Like when you get into Dollar General, it's always going to have about eight to 10 IO and you know where you're gonna get there. It offers very limited selection of goods. In terms of food, we're talking here about mostly canned and uh, dry food. We don't have the in a Tuda sort of foods. But the interesting part of Dollar General is that it focuses on low prices and convenience. People who get to Dollar General, they spend about five minutes in the store. They know what they're getting there. 
I think it's five to 10 minutes, the average time they spend at Dollar Generals. Um, if we look at the Dollar General in 2019, we had one store, at least one store in 46 out of 50 states. And they had over six, 16,000 stores in the country. What is a lot? And Dollar General is in a 30 year consecutive growth. Well, at least it was before pandemic COVID. So take this as before pandemic. And again, what is particular about Dollar General is the business model. And the most of the interviews we see with the CEOs and the leaders, they're going to say Dollar General goes where other big box ain't. So they're locating downtown uh, Chicago, downtown Detroit. They're locating in rural America, like rural of Midwest, rural Florida. So that's places where we won't find Walmart, Target, so on. So what is the question here? So given that Dollar General is expanding as much and opening so many and growing so much, what is the effect of Dollar General on next door firms? And here we're going to be thinking about not only it's uh, not any type of next door firms. We we care about the mom and pops. So those are small firms. And here we're going to define a small firm as those with less than 50 employees. And next door, we're defining that as very close by. So a quarter of a mile, half a mile, or one mile. So we're talking about 400 meters, 800 meters, 1.5 kilometers. So for you guys to have an idea, a quarter of a mile is about one block rate, one block in New York. So, and when we think about effect, what are the outcomes we're going to be looking at? We're going to be looking at sales revenue, uh, employment, and the probability of that store exiting the marketing, so closing permanently. So since this is not a novel, some of the preview of our results. So I'll show here our main specification. And here we are looking at a study event uh, graph. So at year zero, go ahead. I am here and uh, I have a question on uh, one of the students in, uh, in a private chat sent me. Uh, given the proportion uh, Dollar General, it's more or less like a uh, 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 D1, it's stored here in Colombia, or an ARA, or a Justo Bueno. However, uh, they include more things, so it's more like a mix between D1 and Dollar City. Dollar City is a store here that also includes food, clothes, uh, decorations, and other stuff. It's mm -hmm. more or less in the similar size as a Dollar City, so that can be uh, also related to that. However, they include more food than the Dollar City does here. So it would be a mix between the two uh, the two types of store here in Colombia. Uh, uh, yeah, so uh, comparable to Dollar General here, it's going to be maybe family tree. It's not, so Dollar General is very unique because it's not a full blown, blown Walmart, but it's not like that dollar store that we have in Brazil, for instance, that you can find only uh, some services. We, we have like some canned food here. So it's the thing here, this we're talking about a low priced store that has very limited selection, but you can find decorations, you can find um, food, you can find uh, things for your cars, so on and so forth. But it's very unique because it's not like you were walking into a Walmart that you have plenty of choices. So it's a meat, it's a, it's, that's why most people, and I'm gonna get to that, that's a good question because uh, it's not, there are no big consensus or where Dollar General fits. Is that a big box like Walmart and Target? Is that something else? So how should we be thinking about Dollar General? 
So it's, it, it is hard for us to really pinpoint a specific uh, uh, comparison to Dollar General. That's why, that is some of its uniqueness. So I hope I, I, hope I had res, uh, responded the question. So if we look at the preview of results here in, with sales, so we're looking at sales revenue, everything is being compared to year minus one. So year zero is the year a dollar general opened within point here, we're looking at 0.25 miles, if I'm not mistaken. So if, and this graph is pretty much similar to all three uh, specifications. So I'm just gonna show for one specification. And we see that once Dollar General opens, we see some increase in sales revenue. However, for employment, there isn't that result. Like in both sides, we see that the parallel trend, meaning before Dollar General opens, is pretty much flat, which is what we expect in a difference in difference model. And here for employment, we cannot differentiate our results from zero. Then when we're looking at the probability of closing, this is where it's tricky because there is a, the trend of closing that continues. So here we don't have a good, uh, it's hard for us to claim that there is actually a, uh, an effect on exiting or closing because the parallel trend assumption is not really met here, right? So we don't know if that is something that was happening and was going to continue to happen, or if that is the dollar general per se. So how do we contribute to the literature with these results? Well, to our knowledge, we are the first looking at uh, the effect of dollar general. So we are extending this big box and Walmart literature to incorporate another business that has a particular, very unique model of business and that may probably creates these effects on nearby firms. Like we know that whenever a firm enters the ARG in a location, a, the this location decision can be endogenous, but there will be spillover effects there. We differentiate our results in urban and rural effects, which is important, especially in, for Dollar General since it has this focus on rural areas. And then we are gonna be able to provide extra empirical evidence for the theoretical model described by Zhu et al. and other mod, uh, talking about what happens when the, uh, anchor firms enter in a, uh, in a location. Uh, do you guys have any questions or can I move on? What about other competing stars like Dollar Tree, Five Below? Awesome, that's a good question. So we try to, com we control for the number of stores, but we're not looking at these competitors also opening. If they are opening in a systematic way with Dollar General, then that is worrisome. But if they're not opening in, a, in the same pattern as if it's random or in a different business model, that may not affect as much our results, but that is a good, that's a good point. So we try to control for uh, other, we control for other firms that are in the same uh, NAICS classification to uh, investigate if we still see that effect. Good question. Thanks, Monica. So let's go for the conceptual model. So here we're gonna be basing our conceptual model from Zoo et al. And they put a paper that is quite interesting. And the most interesting part for us is their appendix actually, 
because in the appendix, they are going to describe two models that could fit uh, the dollar general story. So let's think about scenario one, story one. Story one is big box or dollar general enters a market in which there are two incumbents and these two incumbents are at different locations to this big box. So there is a incumbent that is closer by and one that is farther away. So they're not really, the big box is not really at that midpoint between the incumbents. So what happens is the big box, because lower prices, more access to uh, goods. So one big thing here is that people really like to, uh, in the literature, they're gonna say that they will try to avoid many trips to different places. So if they can get everything at one location, that is good for them. And sometimes they're gonna make the, uh, this farther drive just to make one stop instead of several um, quick stops. So what happens is big box comes and they're gonna capture the incumbent customers which create loss in profits because there is the shift in the demand to the substitute now. However, the loss in profit is going to be less so to the closer incum incumbent. So the idea here is that there may be agglomeration economies emerging to the closer incumbent. So things I cannot get at the big box, I'll just go to the closer by shop and pick whatever is left. However, this positive externality that the big box can create to the incumbent, the close by incumbent, will depend on the product differentiation. So if I am selling the same things at that big box, then the big box is capturing my customers. But if I can differentiate myself, whatever is left that they cannot pick it up at the big box, they're gonna come to the incumbent. Is that clear, the idea? Uh, and scenario two, we have a big box that enters a monopoly market. And that we can think about maybe in a rural town. You go to big box like Walmart, comes and get to like this smaller location that is has only one uh, incumbent here. So what, what happens here is that the big box actually helps the monopoly, uh, the monopoly and not steals from the monopoly. So I, the idea is that if in this area, if the big box comes, we, we're assuming that there is a growth in consumer demand. So the big box is trying to uh, cater to this consumer increasing in consuming dem consumer demand. So the big box captures part of the monopoly's profit, but because remember the monopoly is able to set prices, right? So if we see a shift in demand for them, prices will go up for the monopoly, especially for the non-competing products. So this makes the monopoly have higher profits because of this shift in the demand curve. All right, so actually it's not really, uh, theoretically, we really don't know what's gonna happen like it remains an empirical question it can be that you it will have these negative effects on profits revenues that comes from stealing uh part of the consumer but it may be that the incumbent is sort of a monopoly and because of the that loss of profits or demand my bad prices will increase and that increase in prices leads to increases in profit, even though the quantity is decreasing, the quantity demanded is decreasing. Okay. All right. So what happens? What, what have you observed in the literature? What is uh, the story of other big boxes? Well, Walmart is known to lure customers from incumbent, reducing their sales. 
and they drive some business out. Uh, so they drive uh, business out of business. Walmart also hurt locally distant incumbents, but provide positive externalities to nearby firms, which is consistent to this scenario one model. And it also increases the number of firms uh, nearby while reducing the firms that are farther away. So people will try, remember, people want to make like this one trip shop. They don't want to be shopping at several locations. Therefore, if there is this big box that acts as an anchor, bringing people to the same area, other firms will try to locate nearby to capture the remaining business that those people are seeking. Sounds good? So can, should we be thinking about Dollar General as a big box? That's where there is still a lot of debate in the literature. If we look at Jenny Schultz, she considers Dollar General a big box because of the type of goods and uh, saying that we are a smaller Walmart. However, Houting Wenger will say that it's not a big box. It's something else. It's not a small firm, it's not a big box, it's something in between. It's something completely odd uh, else than a big box. So, but it, it is, uh, if we look at Dollar General itself, it could serve as an anchor store, but at a, as a, at a smaller size. So if Dollar General acts as, a small, uh, as an anchor, because it is not as big as the dollar, as a Walmart or Target or other bigger stores, it will create these positive externalities, but with effects that are lower than Walmart. So just for us to be capturing some effects, this is uh, interesting because the Walmart literature finds some effects, but not great ones, so we, it's important for us to really uh, place where G Dollar General is in this distribution of big boxes, if we think about that. And again, the business model of Dollar General is completely different from Walmart. So Walmart, the story of Walmart, like it starts in Arkansas and it start, starts growing around the main location and it continues to grow in these big circles, but always having a nice distribution center nearby. So it grows very much around the uh, headquarters and then in a smaller uh, size in the, compared to these larger rings, around distribution centers. Dollar General is completely different in that scenario that they're not really trying to grow from the headquarters. They're just like trying to locate where other firms are not, Walmart is not, Target is not, and they're gonna actually locate stores very close to one another. So it's not out like uh, where I lived in Fort Myers, Three blocks from my house, there was a Dollar General to the left and to the right, six blocks, there was another Dollar General. So they don't, they're not afraid to put stores close to one another, while Walmart will try to differentiate their stores. They will have like the uh, Walmart supermarket, the neighborhood market and the big uh, market, uh, I forgot how it's called, superstore. So we can think about Dollar General as a big box, but it's a little bit different from the traditional big box that we usually see in the literature. So let's take a look at Dollar General in Florida. So actually, currently we have 922 questions. 
papers in the literature studying the effects of big box, not only in the same industry, but across the industry. I'm thinking about local food and clothing producers. So there is a, so this paper by Jenny Schutz, uh, she looks at the effects of, so why big box locate together? The healthy one, but I'm trying to remember now. But yes, there is a, there, there, uh, there are the, like the effects of Walmart on different uh, industries. And this is actually a good uh, point because one extension, one thing we would like to go with this paper is looking at food deserts, which would be, um, again, the effects of this big box on local producers, for instance. So we don't, there, this food desert literature is still scarce, but that is a good question. That is a, an interesting uh, question. And there are some papers, but not, not, not that many, not that many, I think. Hope I answered your question. So Florida currently has $922 general stores. So it's pretty much about one for every 23,000 people in Florida. First, we have an idea on the time period I'm looking. So I'm looking from 2000 to 2013. The number of stores grew by 73%, which is a lot. And there are at least one store within an, or more within another 10 mile radius of another store. So they are pretty close to one another. And if we compare the revenues of Dollar General in Florida to other small firms, so if we think about same 50 employees classifications, we see that Dollar Generals have, they have about, they have a little bit more revenue and a little bit more employment than the other ones. So you have a comparison of what we're looking at here. So what data are we looking at uh, for this paper? So we're gonna be looking at the National Establishment of Time Series, NETS. And NETS is a very cool data set. And for this paper, currently we look from 2000 to 2013, but we just, we should be receiving new data soon which will allow us to go from 1990 to 2017. And we only look at Florida, that's our data. But Florida is a nice market. It's not only the third most populated states in the country, but it's the third largest with, uh, with numbers of Dollar General stores. Also, it's not a poor state. Like we have, if we look at the medium household income, we have the medium household income is $53,000. So we have plenty of demand for the types of goods and services that Dollar General is offering. Next is a time, it's a panel data of firms in the country. And who collects the data is a uh, lawyer's uh, company called Don and Walls. And they collect this data for, to create uh, an index of reliability. So banks can use that for uh, loans. So they're actually, this is a very well-kept data set. And what they do is they call every firm they ever get into the store and they track that firm every year. So we have several characteristics like employment, which is important for us, owner characteristics, so gender, uh, if it's a uh, foreign firm, so on and so forth, uh, the type of business, and here we are gonna have NAICS and SIC codes, the location of the firm, and the location, not only we have the latitude and longitude, but we also have the address, zip code, so we know pretty much where those firms are located, industries, estimated sales, linkage to other firms. So if it's a subsidiary, if it's the headquarters, so on and so forth, how many, uh, when the firm opened, 
when it's the first time it's observed in the data set, um, when the firm leaves the industry. So it's a very rich data set that we have access here. And again, it contains observation for every firm in Florida. Because it, it's so big, like it's about 60 million observations. Like it's a huge file. My computer cannot handle that. And most computers cannot handle this sort of data. Like I asked for, like I can open the data, but it's hard. Like once we start doing regressions, like things blow up. So what I did is I used a 25% random sample, which still gives us a large amount of information as we'll see. And this should still, like if the sample is really random, we should be good in terms of causal inference. Uh, to complement NETS, we're gonna be using the Bureau of Labor Statistics and Census data to capture county time varying social demographic characteristics. Because we are able to go down to the geolocation, I don't have information on census block that is time varying. So I rely on county data, which is a little bit more aggregated or higher level, but it still should be able to explain uh, trends on changes in consumer demand, the types of consumers that are gonna be in that region. So here is a map of our dollar generals. So in uh, gold here, we have all other firms in our sample. And in blue, we have the dollar general stores. And here we break our samples pre and post 2000. Unfortunately for this, ta this time, I can only use the blue dots here to identify uh, the effects of Dollar General. Hopefully, with the new data coming by the end of the month, we're going to be able to use all this data here to really track down these effects of Dollar General. So some descriptive stats here. So we're looking at the number of firms within. So we have 6 million observations. That's a 25% random sample of all other firms, not including Dollar General, right? So here Dollar General, the only information I'm using from Dollar General is its location and the type of industry. So if we look at 17% of my, 3% uh, of my uh, sample is within 400 meters of a Dollar General, 7.5% is about 800 meters and 20% about one mile. So there are lots of treated units here. Annual employment, we're talking about 3.5 uh, employees a year. So really small firms, but we see that there is a larger standard deviation. Uh, I'll, we do make a, uh, some robustness check with this year. We check the distribution, sales revenue, it varies a lot as well. So the average one, we're talking about a bit, a little bit less of half a million dollars, but it can go like to $2 billion, which is crazy. So again, we have a large distribution here and about 8% of the firms leave the market at some point in time. Remember, we are getting the, that we, in our period, we have the great recession hitting us. So firms left, which may not have been because of Dollar General. But anyways, we control for that. Uh, so firms are going to be seven years old on average, meaning that we firms are not like newcomers. We have old firms as well. So we are always going to cap the maximum we could always find is 24 because the data starts in 1999 being collected. So we cannot, we don't know if firms are older than that, unfortunately. So starting at 24 years old, all firms are 24 years old. We know if they have relocated, 
uh, if the CEO is a woman, either a woman or a man, that it's not certain, or if it's a known, the gender, if it's a retail firm, if it's grocery or urban. So most of our results are urban, urban driven. Only 2% of our firms are located in rural areas. Here is a big issue. This, is, this can be a concern. How do we classify urban and rural? That is a whole other debate. That is not in the scope of the paper. And this, it, uh, yeah, I will not get into that. So what do I do? Well, I'll go to the census and look at what they classify as counties as urban and rural based on population and commuting. So they take both of these into account when saying if an area is, uh, belongs to a metropolitan or micro, micro, micropolitan statistical area. And then if they do, they are urban areas. If they don't, they are rural areas. I know it's troublesome, but it's the best we can do. We can play around with this classification here. But yeah, it's urban and rural is like another, this is an, a topic for a whole new conversation. And lastly, in terms of social demographic characteristics, we're going to be looking at percentage of women uh, race, and we can think about uh, Asian, African, if they consider that they have two or more races, other races that are not considered here, uh, Latinos, white, uh, people from 15 to 64 years old, so those in the labor force who would be working and making money, and unemployment, so we can really, uh, unemployment per county, so we can see whether or not, uh, to capture the business cycle of the, that county. So the empirical strategy here is going to we're going to be doing a difference in difference. So we're going to be looking at our Y variable, which is going to be one of those three things that I mentioned, the probability of exiting employment and sales revenue for firm I at industry J, zip code Z, county T in year T, county C year T. Then we have whether a dollar gen, if it's close to a dollar general and after a dollar general opens. And our parameter of interest here is this beta two, which we can interpret as a causal effect of dollar general if two things uh, are met, two assumptions are met. If no time varying characteristics are being affected uh, by uh, the control variables, I mean, if there is no other things changing over time, that affects these outcome variables. So I include a bunch of control variables to try to capture that stuff that could explain. So if demand is going down because social demographic characteristics change it, uh, there is no more consumer. So think about an area that from a year to another, all old people died. So we don't need uh, those hospices anymore, right? So those would go out of business. So we control for things that could affect the dependent variable other than dollar general. And we try to do our best here, but we still can add extra controls. Uh, and if you guys have suggestions, we are more than, uh, that would be helpful. And then um, most, most importantly, the treatment and comparison have to have similar trend before dollar general opening. And that can be an issue. That's the biggest issue. Do, can we guarantee that that is happening? So the issue with the two way fix effect or multiple treatment effect comes into mind here. So it's the similar trend assumption here. We're, we need to think about two things going on that we have the pre-treatment being, uh, the pre-trend has to be the same 
but then once the treatment start, it may not change over time. So it's very time specific. If those are not met, if those two things are not met, what happens is that my estimated parameter are going to be in weighted average of all possible combinations of treatment effects. And we don't want that. We only want that uh, particular effect of the treatment, meaning the opening. So think about a Dollar General opening. If a Dollar General opens in Cali in 2005 and another one opens in Bogota in 2010, Cali is being treated for longer time for the effect of a Dollar General. Because remember, in our conceptual model, Dollar General can be acting as a anchor store, shifting where people are buying goods and services. So we could see an effect that changes over time. Therefore, one possible solution is to do an event study, and that's the path we follow. So what we're going to do here, so the event study, according to Goodman Bacon 2019, if you have not read that paper, highly recommend to take a look at that. And there is so much going on with two-way fixed effects and so much going on with uh, different, difference in difference. Um, it's hard to be kept with the literature. So what we do here is we look at a 10 year window. Remember we have 24 years and we are gonna look at a 10 year window. Um, so we look at five years before and five years after the Dollar General opens. We're gonna make, we're gonna normalize alpha. So at alpha K is going to be a dummy whether or not uh, that it's relative to the time event when the dummy, it's not a dummy, it's the, well, it is a dummy when, so if the year is, if Dollar General opens at year zero, at 2000, and we're looking at the year 2000, alpha K is going to be zero. If it's 2001, alpha K is, one, two, and for all these alpha, these are all dummy variables being included here in our model. Is that clear, the idea? Okay, and what we're gonna do is just normalize alpha minus one to zero. So everything we do is relative to the period just before uh, Dollar General opened. Make sense? So we're, Year zero is the opening. Let's see what happens at that point. So we've seen that the graphs before, right on the first part of the analysis. So here I'm just gonna take a look at the table. We see we don't see anything going on here, but so we're looking, this is our parameter of interest. Remember, this year is the is the weighted average of all possible combinations. So it's not really the causal effect here. So we see a negative effect on sales for firms within a mile, which is different from what we saw on the graphs, right? We saw an increase over time. We again see a, a negative effect on employment and on the study event we, show, we see no effect and a negative effect on exiting. But if you look at the study event, we actually see an increasing, but we cannot actually differentiate. In everything, however, everything that we see, we see a positive effect on revenue. Being close to the dollar general affects positively the uh, revenue, employment, but also the probability of exiting. But this here is the true effect, right? It's after the Dollar General really opens. So the results I like the most are the study event. So let's talk about robustness check. Like what have I done here to try to uh, convince you that my results are true? 
So looking at half a mile and one mile, the results are pretty much the same as what we had with 0.25 miles. Nice flat trend. Pre-trend is good, not good, but increasing revenues, no effect on employment, positive effect on closing, exiting. Same thing here. If we split our sample into urban and rural, again, looking at 0.25 miles, urban is what's driving our results, increasing revenues, no effect on employment, exiting same thing. No effect at all for rural in either sales, employment, and exiting that same trend. Again, this, I think it's just something that was going on over that period of time here in Florida. So I don't have any, I don't claim anything, anything about the probability of exiting, especially because I cannot guarantee this pre-trend here. Now let's look at retail. So Monica, for your, you asked, so we looked at retail and groceries. Oh, the effect only at groceries to see if we would see an effect. And the groceries and retail effect are going to be very similar as well. Here we see like some numbers popping up on the retail when we look at the uh, sales, the employment and all that, if, especially for the closer ones and that farther away is our, we have the negative effect which resembles us that idea from the conceptual model described on Zoo. But when we look at the uh, graphs, we go back to that nice effect on uh, sales revenue, but no much effect on employment. Now, remember we had a large uh, standard error or standard deviation on our firm size. So as we plot the distribution, most of the firms are right here within zero and five employees. So let's look at those very, very small firms up to 10 employees only. Revenues, same result. But now when we look at an employment, after a while we have some, some result here. After five years, there is some benefits. Very little evidence to claim that something's going on. And we also break that down to urban and rural and the results are going to be similar to what we had on the main specification. Results are being driven by urban. And this is not surprising because since we have 80%, 98% of our sample coming from urban areas, but it would be really nice if we could see something going on in rural areas, especially because that's where they focus on. So what is the conclusions here and where can, how can we think about these results in a policy implication? So we have, in my opinion, strong evidence that dollar general effects the neighbor's revenue. And just one thing here to make certain, because just to uh, explain, because we have zero revenues, sometimes we use the uh, sales, the, what's the name, the sign, the sign transformation for the sales. So we can interpret this here as elasticities, not elasticities, but percent changes since we're looking at a dummy variable. So this is percent changes. Uh, the dollar general have, may have some effect on, on, on unemployment if we think about the very small business after five years, but again, not immediate, very weak evidence. We need stronger evidence here. And there are no clear results on exit, especially since we cannot guarantee that pre-trend going on. So what is the implication here? So our results based on that, those two uh, scenarios from the Zoom model, Dollar General seems to be acting as an anchor. 
And actually, there are several towns in rural America that are trying to bring a Dollar General to the area as an anchor. So if that is being the case, well, that is a, uh, if they are acting as an anchor means that they are stealing customers from uh, elsewhere, but they are also creating positive externalities to those nearby firms because if they can complement Dollar General, their businesses drive up. Uh, Mom and Pop may have been hurt by the low cost, uh, big box retailers and retail shopping areas, but Dollar General has the power to do the opposite. So in extreme, extreme cases, it may actually be revitalizing uh, some areas because of these anchor characteristics. So although maybe we may see some, some mom and pops being hurt, others are uh, getting benefits. It depends on the, again, the differentiation to Dollar General and the distance to the Dollar General store. So this is a work in progress. We don't even have a working paper posted. The one we distribute is for internal circulation only. Uh, so ideally, and this is close to occur, to include, expand our time period that we are looking at, include extra controls. Again, the controls that we add here, I can go back. We have only demographic characteristics. And when we look at the uh, firm here, we're just looking at CEO, if the firm changed the sector and the age. And if you look at social demographic characteristics, pretty much this is age and race composite, race, gender and rate, age, race and gender composition and unemployment rate. So ideally we would like to include more controls that are time varying so we can get all that sort of bad variation from our uh, results and we can really pick up the effect of Dollar General. I think another step should be to continue to increase this radius to see if the, if this positive effect ends or when, or if it reverses and we start seeing negative effects. Most importantly, I think it's important for us to explore through which mechanism is Dollar General effect affecting the different neighbors? And this is something we are, if you guys have any suggestion, uh, we'd appreciate. And again, another different question that we are working and trying to think about on this Dollar General perspective is once Dollar General enters the area, do we see, uh, does it uh, help eliminate food deserts or at least alleviate food deserts since people can use um, benefit programs, uh, they snap at, uh, they snap benefits at Dollar Generals and you can find some quality food that you won't find in other places like Wawa or gas stations. Oh, that's this is what I had. Uh, I'm stopping sharing now. Any questions, comments will be very much welcome. Okay, thank you, Amir. Um, the first thing that comes to mind for my for my experience is uh, how different could be the different the dollar general the general in different areas. Uh, as, as a little example, you know the Dollar, Gen the Dollar General in Morgantown, there would be three or four Dollar Generals, one in downtown and the other ones uh, by other areas of the city. But usually the one in downtown, you would see it, uh, it would be crowded with a lot of, uh, more, with a lot more homeless people than the ones in, uh, the, the one that was near the Kroger, by uh, the Kroger, uh, Kroger, 
No, no Kruguero, not Kruguero, the one by, uh, by my house, by, uh, okay. uh, yeah. By Walnut, was it, was it Walnut? No. Walnut, yeah, yeah. Oh, by Walnut, yeah, but by, by Walnut. So the wall, the Walnut, um, the the door, the people you would normally see in the, the three dollar donuts were completely different. Sure. Uh, so that could be a small differentiating part in the in the effect that you can create or what you would see in people. Normally, I would uh, be more aware of who was inside. Uh, General in the one in downtown because there were a lot of homeless people there. While while in, while while in the other one, I would not feel that much uh, conscient of uh, who was there. Mm, that uh, well, that is due to well, main, main, uh, main no, Yeah, this is a good point. Like mm -hmm. the effects may be heterogeneous across yes. these locations. So yeah. this is exactly. something we can definitely exactly. explore. Exactly. Um, uh, it's Probably very like finding this very <laughs> fine geographical uh, information for us to differentiate. Uh, another what thing we control for, right? Because it's not only controlling for the location, but we need to com we would need to control for the type of people doing business there and all that stuff. However, one thing that I'm so. One thing that works well on our situation, and you tell me if you buy that or not, is Dollar General has a business model. So they are locating quote unquote similar areas that are gonna be isolated, downtown, poorer areas. Mm -hmm. So it's not that I'm comparing, uh, so if we're gonna talk about Oregon Town, it's not like I'm comparing that downtown area to like Suncrest. No, or, no, yeah, exactly. But the customers were different, and I think that could be measured with the walkability scale or walkability index that you could have. That is probably available for every year in Florida, at least for a big part of the sample. Uh, right. That could be something that could be relatable for that, because maybe uh, I don't know in the ones in Florida or the one that was near to your house, how walkable could it be to move in Florida uh, in that direction. Uh, I don't, I, as I recall my experience with Florida, if you try to walk in the middle of, yeah, exactly. You don't walk in Florida. You don't walk, exactly. Uh, but that is, uh, that is part of uh, what is, uh, what can be defined of the environment that you could measure there. Uh, good thing from the walkability indexes is it can be, it can be something that is as local as uh, the zip code or smaller areas. So it can have a lot of variation, but uh, the, only, the only problem is uh, there could be some heterogeneity due to the fact that you measure walkability by accessibility, measure accessibility to other, to most uh, businesses. So there are two ways to measure walkability, one that is structural and another one that is uh, access accessibility. The structural would be more related to the existence of walk path and sidewalks in order to walk from one place to the other and crossing lines or, or other places like that. While the other one would be related to the existence of like, for example, banks near or other companies near, which is, the endogenous part to what you are trying to measure. So I would suggest to uh, explore more the structural part. However, the structural part has less variability throughout the years. Or you can uh, use instrument, instrument uh, previous uh, walkability indexes, years as an instrumental variable for current changes so you can avoid those issues. That's my first thought. Uh, on the second side, uh, do you consider, uh, I don't know, I still think that there could be, a, there could be a little, have you considered, uh, so you have the, the effect within 25 miles, 200.25 uh, miles. Have you considered, um, 
a little uh, comparison between that and the further one as uh, changes in the effect through time. I mean, uh, so if you have an opening within, within 20.250 miles, and then there was an opening before within the other. Okay, so multiple openings. Yeah, multiple openings in different areas, in different time, in different distances. So that's a good question, one. So what we do, we're just looking at the first open. Yeah. We don't look at, like if another store opened, uh, we consider the first store that opened. So that's a awesome. That, that could be now, so I'm looking at the. Uh, yeah, we should control for the number of stores, maybe, um, because now we're talking about the intensive and extensive margins. Right. Here. So it, that's the thing with it, like effect uh, the size of the treatment, right? Yeah. So we are looking only at the, that first opening. So yeah. Yeah, that might be also relevant for that. I don't know. Uh, Mm -hmm. But again, but yeah, but that's a good question. All right, so that is an awesome question. So, although, uh, that's a great question. So now I'm I'm remembering <laughs> some that we did. No, because it's been a while since I did the paper and wrote the piece. But although most there are lots of the Dollar General stores close by. Mm -hmm. They are usually farther away than one mile, mm -hmm. but they are less than 10 miles. So they are close by, but not that close. So oh. it kind of, there are a few uh, instances, but we're looking at that first opening. And that's why I don't want to go too farther out as well, because then I start incurring in this issue that other dollar generators are opening, and then I have like more ones to consider. Yeah, yeah, but that also might affect um, part of the uh, job creation in the area because there might be a reinforcement effect on the neighboring uh, on the neighboring zip code on the neighboring areas for the zip code or the sensor blocks that you might account for. Uh, I don't know. So, do you think? Uh, I should consider these spatial spillovers as well. That 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 is, that was the original idea. That they, that's the source for my comment, actually. Yeah, that's what. <laughs> that's the source for my comment. I think. Uh, uh, I don't know. I don't know. I think that might be might be relevant to consider it anyway. I might. Yeah, but again, the. People want to make, they don't, they're not afraid of driving a little farther, but they want to make like this one quick stop. Yeah. Or they want to make like this uh, more complete um, shopping. So maybe it's not, if I have another Dollar General, but when, or how many other, like when I have more Dollar Generals available, and what sort of amenities are close by this dollar general. So yeah. it's like this combination effect. Yeah. Yeah, that is true. That is true. Yeah. Huh. At least I give you something to think about. <laughs> yeah, I don't think we have any more comments. Uh, well, if anyone has any comment or question to ask Amir, he works a lot with also uh, a lot of uh, provision of libraries and how they affect growth in regional areas. So any question related to that? Uh, libraries, urban amenities, place based policies. That's the and input output models. I still need to. Uh... Oh, well, we had we had a presentation on input output like uh, three weeks ago. Uh, one guy is, did uh, the regional effect of the of the quarantines on the on the input uh, output model. The Bank of Colombia, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, 
they, yeah, I mean, they, they, they study it with uh, Eduardo, yeah. I know yeah, that. exactly. For the database that Eduardo created, that we still want to check it out so we can use it, but still the launch of that database was postponed. Well, I think I'm going to stop recording.